Chateau de Luçon in the Vaud canton of Switzerland, a remote medieval castle once visited by emperors and popes. For some years now, it's been the home of an Englishman, Adrian Conan Doyle, son of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes and the world's best-selling author of all time after the Bible and Shakespeare. Adrian Conan Doyle devotes his life to sustaining his father's memory and reputation. At the Chateau's Conan Doyle Foundation, he has created the famous Sherlock Holmes room. Room. This is a famous room, 221B Baker Street. Fog outside the window and so on. Now, the most important thing about this room is that everything is genuine. The tobacco, the, the um, whiskey, everything is about 1890. Uh, I should have to speak to Mrs. Hudson about this. Um, 1890, and it's, you know, it's more difficult to find a, uh, tobacco of that period than to find Leonardo da Vinci today. And all England helped us find these things. Uh, everything in the room is named in the story. There's not a single object here which is not named in one or other of the stories. Every object? Yes, every object. It's hard to imagine because there's so uh, many. You take those books, for instance. Now, those books had to be, we decided on the date, I think it was 1894. All those books had to be previous to 1894. If we found, for instance, um, Clark Russell uh, of 1895, no good. So they, we searched England, we got them. The, um, all the chemical gear, it's all of the period, was very kindly presented by the Welcome Historical Museum. And you'll find all these relics of Holmes's personal characteristics and idiosyncrasies. His, for instance, you've got the famous Shringe over there. Oh, why, why do you think your father made him a drug addict? It's rather later in the story. Well, no, I think it was rather, you know, at that period, the, the, um, you had um, a certain feel coming out of the earlier Victorian authors. And to, to make a man's uh, outstanding, you uh, had to give him certain little piccadillos or vices of his own. And I think you had it coming through Stendhal and, and through De Quincey and others like that, you see. And so he made him a drug addict. Now, uh, not exactly an addict, because he was always a master of the drug. Holmes was always a master of cocaine. Never was cocaine the master of Holmes. But now the medical profession have come to the conclusion that he was never a drug addict at all. That he did it to annoy Watson. He pretended a, to He pretended. There was only water. Oh, what a shame. No, I'm with you. I agree. I think he was certainly, he was a cocaine taker, but he was never an addict. He was always the master. Mm. What are the letters pinned? Ah, now you remember Holmes had a habit of... Um, skewering his unanswered correspondence to the mantelpiece with a jackknife. And there it is, all unanswered. There's his cigars, of course, in the coal scuttle, his tobacco in the Persian slipper, uh, all these sticks, of course, connected either with the Hound of the Baskervilles or with the, um, with the poison belt, other famous cases. Those are some of his ch uh, chemical formulae. And those, are, those are all the contemporary. Oh, yes. Everything here is contemporary. Every single thing. And even these books contain, these, the famous indexes actually do contain reports on crime cases. We have a, a violin of appearance. Unfortunately, it's not a Strad. But, um... What's this? A chemical? Is, oh, yes, a contemporary book on chemicals. That's right. The microscope of the period, of course, low-power microscope. These are blood samples. Obviously, Holmes has been taking some experiments on blood. His boxing gloves, he's a great boxer, you remember? And then over here, you have other famous relics. By the way, I'm very sorry that they're both not here to greet you. They're out, but you see they were called away in the middle of their tea. Uh, those are rather nice, mm. these little uh, lead balls here. They were actually taken out of the body of a murdered man. They're two bullets. Scotland Yard, they kind of gave them to Holmes. It's part of the myth, isn't it, to pretend that Watson and Holmes are still alive. Do you play along with that? There's no myth. Heavens above, myth. How do you never get along without Holmes 
Watson. Here's a gasogene, the famous gasogene. And uh, that's where Watson used to bring, uh, keep the brandy. I think it was in there. Because it was not, or it might have been in here. I think it was in here because a cork comes out more easily. He was always rushing, you remember, to give clients brandy on the site of his publication. I love the, the bullets in the wall. Ah, the VR, Victoria Regina. Mm -hmm. And that's the mark of the air gun slug, you remember, in the uh, empty house, the adventure of the empty house, when that loathsome character, Sebastian Moran, tried to rob us of Holmes. But uh, it went through the, the shadow of Holmes. His head was really a plaster bust and ended there. You're playing along very much with the myth of Sherlock Holmes, but in fact your father rather resented the fact that his reputation depended on Holmes rather than the rest of his writing, did Well, he? reputation, no. I wouldn't put it that way. I would say that uh, he was fond of Holmes. The idea that he disliked Holmes is absolute nonsense. But uh, he took the view, and I entirely agree with that view, that Holmes obscured his finer writings. The White Company, St. Nigel, the Gerard stories and so on, which have been in print after all for 80 years, in the case of the White Company, never out of print, which to my way of thinking is a proof of immortality in a book of great literature. And he felt rightly that, that uh, Holmes is obscuring his more important work. There's been a good deal of speculation as to who was the original for Sherlock Holmes. Was there? A person on whom the character of Sherlock Holmes was based? The character, no. Um, the methods, yes. Uh, my father's old professor, Dr. Bell, uh, was certainly the model on which the methods of Sherlock Holmes are based. The, the methods of observation and deduction began and ended there. The personality of Holmes and the uh, way of putting those methods into practice in real life crime did not belong to Bell at all, it belonged to my father. And Bell himself was one of the first to see that, because he wrote to my father and said, you are yourself, Sherlock Holmes, and well you know it. How did your father feel about that? He admitted it at the very end of his life. When he knew he was dying, he gave one last interview to an American journalist. This is in 1930. And he said, I confess now that if anybody was Sherlock Holmes, it was myself. Of course, all the criminologists knew it right away. That's why the French uh, named, for instance, the uh, Certe uh, Police Laboratories in Lyon are the laboratory of Conan Doyle. They recognized at once and they were continuously in correspondence with my father about many famous cases. Um, I have in my files an article, a leader from the Times, written about two years before my father created Holmes, pointing out that the results of Scotland Yard were obtained entirely through chance, that there was no method, absolutely no chance. And he invented a system whereby things like cigarette ashes, dust, other things of that nature, should uh, yield their own message, their own story. Up to then, nobody done anything with this. And that is why you get a man like Locar, who's today recognized as probably the greatest criminologist, he with Lombroso, that Europe's ever produced, has put it on record in these words. If we are interested in dust today, it is because of the ideas which have imbibed from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The use of plaster of Paris for observing delicate marks and so on. All this came through Holmes. Now Holmes was a puppet sitting on my father's knee. His ideas, his words spoke through Holmes. And so it's really very difficult to differentiate one man, man from the other. They both belong to each other. This mass of contradictions which makes up Sherlock Holmes. A lot of that belonged to my father, not the misogynist, but the rest of it, not the violin playing and not the drugging, but all the rest of the Holmes' habits belonged to my father. He was an excellent boxer, he was very untidy, he had this mind that sometimes was crystal clear and other times was dreaming. There was a great deal of a self-portrait. You've written Holmes stories yourself, haven't you, since your father's death? Yes, I did one book, The Exploits of Sherlock Holmes. Um, the last six or seven stories were done by me alone because my old friend Dixon Carr fell very ill. We collaborated over the first four or five. The remaining stories were written entirely by myself alone. Do you find the stories easy to write? No. Far more difficult than my father. Because she, I know that if I go outside the picture, remember he was brought up in that period, I was not. If I make one mistake, all his enthusiasts will be all over me. The Japs will be on my neck, the Russians will be on my neck, the English, the French, everybody who reads Holmes say, ah, worthless son, he's made a, an error. And I made one. 
It had the whole lot of it. One only. I had the, 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 the bell of the fire engine going in, I think it was a, in a story which I dated 1894, and I think the bell wasn't bought until 1895. That was my own mistake. Could you tell me why you founded the Arthur Conan Doyle Foundation? What, what is its purpose? Well, I have no children, and I wanted to leave a living memorial to my father. And though my father was an, uh, a patriot, a very great patriot, as his whole life proved, he was not a nationalist, he was an internationalist. And we're living, I think, today, we're beginning to understand the meaning of the word internationalism. And I was determined if I made a foundation to my father, it should not be in England. It should be abroad, an English foundation abroad. Everything here is English. Everything is from my house, family house in England. The construction of the Sherlock Holmes room is an English room of the Victorian period and so on. And I have made, I believe I'm correct in saying, the only English cultural foundation on this side of the channel. And I think the wisdom of my decision has been proved by the events, because we've had people coming from all over the world, all nationalities, to the Conan Foundation to see it. Of course, Sir Arthur Gandor had enormous associations with Switzerland himself, didn't he? Yes, he did. They made Holmes um, an honorary citizen of Marion, which is near this town last year, which has never happened before in the history of Switzerland, that a character out of a book should have been made um, a member with voting rights of a Swiss town, which means, of course, the beginning of a new tradition, which in a hundred years' time, they can say, but Holmes lived here. He has the proof. There is his citizen. Voting rights, I mean, he must have lived here. We'd never have done this otherwise. You see, we're talking of Holmes again. It's always Holmes that we speak of when we speak of your father. Well, that's your fault. You've been asking questions. It isn't to do him justice, really. What was the, the writing that he was most proud of? Oh, without doubt, his historical novels. Mm. Because they really... They did hold up a mirror to English history. And yet, at the same time, they're fascinatingly interesting. And it took him a long time to write. And that's it. He was a craftsman. And in the White Company, he buried himself away for two or three years, you know. Read nothing but books on the 14th century, when his whole mind was soaked in that period, he picked up his pen and he wrote that immortal work. And I use the word immortal because it was written 80 years ago. It's never been out of print. Never. And uh, I doubt it ever will be, as long as people like good books. We were very close family, as you recall. Oh, very. Extremely close. I think I've suggested that in the fact my father used to come down and read his stories to us in the evening, so... Uh, we were very un united and a very devoted family. So right from your very early years, you knew him closely? Yes, we did. You know, it was a family where my mother and father were deeply in love with each other, and that gave a kind of light to the whole family life. Did he take an enormous interest in your education, then? Did he have any particular ideas about it? Yes, he had. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of our talk together that he was an internationalist. And for that reason, I did not follow my elder brother to Eton. I went to a, a tutor's, a rather famous tutor's, it doesn't exist any longer, where they would only take four English students. All the rest of them were French and German and Italian. And as a result, I had the corners rubbed off me, because at that stage, I felt England and the lot of inferior races made up the world. See? But I <laughs> learned differently. And the result is now that I have you know, old school fellows who are friends of mine all over Europe, different nationalities. Would you say that you'd adopted his code of morals and manners? No, conduct? it was never a question of morals. It never a question of morals. It was a question of a certain code of living. It's a different thing. Uh, he understood the word honor to the fullest sense of the word. He, his sense of honor was that of a medieval knight. I don't say mine is. I come padding along behind as a rather unworthy squire, but I try my best. There are very many Sherlock Holmes societies throughout the world. It's, it's a most incredible literary cult. What do you think of them? Well, I'm glad you used the word literary cult, because sometimes I imagine it's a religious cult, the way some of these people behave. Uh, the rank and file are perfectly genuine students and scholars of Holmes, normal, sane people who love the books for what they are. Unfortunately, there is another, much smaller strata, which really does um, comes almost into the abnormal, where you have the most extraordinary labored works to prove that Watson was a lesbian, or that Holmes was in fact Moriarty. 
and uh, things of that type, which are extremely offensive, very offensive, because my father was a very pure writer in his thinking. He never made any great mystere about the psychological approach of Watson to Holmes and nonsense of that kind. They were two perfectly honest men working together. I'm like, fascinated, as I know that many other people are, by your father's interest in spiritualism, which he investigated, as you were telling me earlier, for many years of his life. How much can you tell me about that? Well, that's an enormous question, because you're asking me to give you a description of a man's investigation that covered, what, 35 years before he found his first proof, and which took him all over the world. And the last part of his life was devoted entirely to giving these lecture tours, because... When it came to the end of the First World War, there was a tremendous question. We have lost millions of young men all over the world. What's happened to them? Are they only two buckets of salt or a bucket of water where it composes a body? Or is there the life beyond the grave? And the churches were totally incapable of giving a reply. Totally incapable. And my father and Sir Oliver Lodge and other men who had this knowledge considered it was incumbent upon them to do this at whatever risk. And many of these men sacrificed their scientific reputation and everything absolutely martyred. Just as it, without the physical, but mentally, in the same sense of the early Christian martyrs, it was simply ostracized. Was your father treated like that? No. Uh, he was not, because he wasn't dependent upon scientific societies and things like that. He could stand on his own feet and fight. And that's why some other men, whose names were also household words that they had to sacrifice more than he, Nevertheless, he sacrificed an enormous amount, including a, a fortune in money devoted to it. And uh, he spent the rest of his life going all over the world, lecturing all over the world, in the, all the great cities, telling people, yes, they are still alive, and it is possible to communicate, and it is possible to get absolute proof. We don't ask you to believe. You've got to get the knowledge for yourself so that you know it's true. Never believe until you've got the proof. This was prompted by the First World War, was it? The importance of the mission was prompted by that. The situation didn't exist till then. It was only a question, it was um, an epidemic question. But that World War, that frightful slaughter, changed the, the position of humanity. I mean, after all, this Second War we've been through, apart from the Russian front, was nothing compared to the First World War, where the whole generation was born was. And the churches had no answer to anything. Did your father feel very much that religion, in fact, had failed everyone at that time? Very much. And my father, I think, was supported with the majority of the world opinion. They could give no answer. Now, the lecture tours that he went on were, were concerned with spiritualism entirely. Yes. It's a word I hate. What, what would you use? Survivalism. It's a question of individual survival after death. Did he offer the proof to the public? Oh, yes. Enormous amount of it. But he always said, you, you can only get proof yourself, never through the lips of a third party. Mm. You've got to go out and look for it yourself, taking every precaution against fraud and folly. They exist. They exist in banking. They exist in law. They exist everywhere, form and folly, wherever the human element comes in, and also in the psychic. But course, we're talking a great deal about the religious aspect. The other side of my father, which is even more interesting to me, was his incredible clear-mindedness, his services for England. And that's a thing that's been too often looked, uh, overlooked in, in articles about this extraordinary man. Um, I don't think there's been any man who, between the period of 1895 and the end of the First World War, had a greater impact upon English, upon England, and I the modern history of England at that time. In what His way? impact was felt in every, behind every major crisis at that time. My father was moving behind the scenes. He worked very closely with Churchill and with many other of the outstanding public men. He was responsible for such diverse things as the introduction of the Court of Criminal Appeal into English law, as a result of the Adalji case. He was directly responsible for such things as the wound stripe. He made the first tests for the steel helmets for the army the May West life jackets for the Navy, all this came out of that tremendously talented mind with its many facets all working at full blast. What do you think is his greatest achievement? What a question. His greatest achievement. I think 
Uh, his greatest literary achievement was the White Company, and I think his greatest civic achievement, achievement was the result of the Adalgia case that brought in the Court of Criminal Appeal. Because so many innocent, innocent people uh, benefited through that. Adrian Campbell, thank you very much.